howling generalisations then, so please don't hold me to anything I'm saying. Read the paper instead if you, if you find the need. Um, what you see when you look overseas, instead of um, uh, limited partnership type structures being encouraged through tax expenditure, a lot of um, tax expenditure regimes focused on venture capital overseas look at corporate vehicles still and provide incentives to corporate vehicles. Um, uh, the main type of incentive given is still tax holidays, so tax, um, tax exemption. Tax exempt dividends generally can flow through. So again, as Stephen was saying, that provides a nice concession on the upside if your investments do well, but it traps your losses at the corporate level um, if, you're, if um, the investee companies, the small and um, medium enterprises, uh, do poorly. And I think it's worth keeping in mind that it's a, a, ta a tax expenditure uh, regime or, or, um, or program that is di designed to create investment. When investors think about things, they think about risk-reward ratios. And um, uh, what a lot of venture capital programs uh, do, do, particularly overseas, is shield the uh, upside from tax, mm -hmm. but don't do much about ensuring lot against losses when those losses happen. I will say this, when you look at um, Singapore and Malaysia, they do still provide some possibility for shielding um, uh, against losses. Um, for instance, in Malaysia, there's a choice, instead of taking a tax holiday, um, to take um, what they call a deduction on investments, um, but when you exit. <laughs> so that's held until um, Sell the shares. It acts as a form, form of loss, loss insurance. The big, the big criticism that BCLPS gets is essentially um, by not giving you the losses, it doesn't shield you from the real risk that you have. I've just received the red card, that usually means you're sent off, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll say thank oh, you. I think it was yellow. So um, while Stephen, I suppose, mapped what's happened in Australia, where we've gone from an upfront deduction, expensive, um, to a system that only rewards success. When you look at Singapore and Malaysia, uh, I, I think that they're probably going along the same path, or they could well be going along the same path. They're, they're a step behind in, in that process. They're still slightly rewarding uh, failure in, um, in investments and mainly rewarding um, success, but I think that, that that may change the general trend is going to be more towards the Australian approach. I will say
say that if I had my lecture in Italian, only a few number of people would notice the difference at this time of the afternoon. But yeah, I'm joking because I clearly understand that at the beginning a defensive position, my own is a difficult position. It's a difficult position because yesterday and this morning I followed the, the presentation, the papers, and I see the colleagues of mine uh, presenting their ideas, defending their thesis, their position, and justifying what they, what they have written, their papers. Uh, I have to defend and to justify my me being here between you. Because when Rick Kramer invited me here, I was not reluctant at the first time. Because, uh, because I'm Italian and European, and I said, well, Rick, I have nothing to deal with that Australasian association of lecturers and professors, because I'm not from Australia, I'm not from Asia. I said, well, never mind, you can come and be our first and wait in Europe, etc. Then this morning, I discovered that with the word Australasia, you mean Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> so my, my position, my position is even worse than that. And right now, I have, I have the perfect idea that I'm the wrong person in the wrong place. Australasian place, Tasmania. And just mean to go out, okay. But anyway, I'm from Italy. So the wrong person in the wrong place, but I think that like in logic or in math, when you have two negations in the same phrase, maybe you can get out some both by your language. When you, my teacher at the high school said, wait, Mark, you can't say I don't understand nothing because you need to understand something. Why, in Italian, it's completely the other way around. When you say you don't understand nothing, you really don't get it. So something positive, something interesting for you. And I decided just to give you a uh, first view of what the state of the art of the European road fixation of pessimism. Very quick, and trying to stress the aspect which could be of uh, more interest for non-European countries. So let's begin. Uh, you know, or probably you know, that the European law, European tax law, uh, touches both VAT, indirect taxation, which is uh, developed here, we love the, the book of the legislation, but also direct taxation. However, in direct taxation, we don't have specific provisions. Because why? What are the reasons? Because tax already, first of all, uh, there is a, 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 a French academic, Nimoyer, who says that taxation is the hunting reserve, direct taxation, the hunting reserve of the sovereign state. So when uh, the member state of the European Union entered into the Treaty of Rome uh, more than 50 years ago, uh, they were willing to give to the European Union uh, power to rule on VAT, on excises, new customs, but not on direct taxes. That's the point. So this is why direct taxation is not immediately relevant, at least it was not relevant in 1957. The consequences of this approach is that we have only a very limited, very restricted number of directives implemented nowadays on direct taxation and more to the point of passing which we talked about of our table. And at the same time, where the legislature can get the European Court of Justice, the case law, is get more and more important in Europe. However, today, you I will focus myself on, on the legislation. Why? Why you should be or you should be interested in passive taxation in the European law in this respect? Because Europe, you know, it, have, uh, has 27 phases for direct taxation, but in some cases, only one. These are the most relevant cases for us, and I think for you as well. The taxation of dividends, of interest, and royalties is harmonized all across Europe in a sense that we'll try to specify later. And also some mergers and acquisition operations are harmonized. Moreover, not counting the directive that I'll mention right now, there is also an article, Article 56 of the Treaty of, the Treaty of Rome, Treaty of the European Union, which defends and fosters the free movement of capital. And that provision is important because it is the only article that is thought and written not only for the European countries, but also for the third countries. You know, Europe is built on four fundamental freedoms, free movement of persons, of capitals, of labor, freedom of establishment, etc. The free movement of capital is written also for third countries. Within a minute, I'll tell you, I'll try to tell you why. This is the point where we're asking. So, what means uh, free movement of capital? 
prohibition of any restriction on movement of capitals and of payment as well between member states, between France and Italy, for instance, but, we know, but also between Italy and Australia, or New Zealand, etc. However, some restrictions still up, uh, particularly the restrictions that were enforced and implemented before 1993. While the other freedom of individuals, of goods, of services, etc., are full and implemented for European countries only. Why Article 453? Is it a gift that we give to other countries? But it could seem at first glance that it is not. It is to foster, it is the legal watchdog, first of all, now, of the euro currency. When third country investors get the money in Europe, they change the money into European currency, they buy shares in Europe, they buy bonds, etc. They are sure that their investment, they can step into Europe. It's easy to get in, but it's also easy to get out. And Article 56 is built up as an insurance, and is an insurance for the third country investors in that respect. Of course, there are also some of the questions. The first one, what kind of investment? What do you mean? What do we mean with investment? Up to what extent we can consider an economic operation, such as an investment? In the case, what if in a specific case, an operation, an economic operation, is covered or could, or could fall into two fundamental freedoms? For instance, the freedom of establishment and the movement of capital. If you take the case of an Australian corporation who buys shares in a European company, can buy 1%, 2%, etc. of the capital, and maybe in the future, uh, the Australian company find in the situation of winning the gap this participation. If it does so, it fails under, under the Article 56 of the treaty. But the European Court of Justice say that if the Australian company, for instance, by 51% of the capital of the European company, that's no longer the movement of capital. It's freedom of establishment. Because you are not only investing capital, waiting for a profit. We are carrying on a business in Europe. In the second case, we are not under Article 6, but under Article 43. A different freedom. It is not a zero sum game for you because 56 is for Australians as well. 43 not. Only for Europeans. It's an important point to begin with, I think. So, what are the investments to cover by 56? Financial capital, of course, loans, bonds, etc. Investment. And the European Court of Justice is quite clear in this respect. It is clear in this respect and is also focused on a restricted interpretation of lack of the free movement of capital. That is to say that in every case where 56 gets into conflict with another freedom, then the other freedom applies and 56 does not. So, the subject of my talk, the subject of the paper is euro taxation. The first point to be clear, to be clarified, is that the notion of passive income is not, is not Italian and maybe it's not European. I use that because I, I realize, well, used the, in, the, in the UK, for instance, the United States, and maybe even in Australia, but I mean basically dividends, interest, and royalties. You see from the slide from Power Board, it asks the kind of income which have a specific regulation all across Europe. Two directives, but we're the most important, they are 435 in 1990 and 49 in 2003. The first one for dividends that was, that was subsequently amended a couple of years ago, and the last one in, on interest and royalties. Think about this fact that the, the directive 49 in 2003 was drafted for the first time in 1990. It took us 13 years to have been adopted, two years or more later. So the, 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 the speed of the behavior of the European Union in this respect is quite, quite awkward. And we need, we, need, we need time. And if you think about it, nowadays Europe encompasses a land from Portugal to, to, to Poland, from the Baltic states to Italy and to Malta, while the decision-making process is getting always slower and slower in this respect. Dividend payments. What does Directive 40, uh, 435 say? 
The aim of the Sudbaga directive is to avoid double taxation and to obtain an efficient taxation of the cross-border duties. I reckon this respect, there are 435 touches, the withholding tax and the taxation on the states of revenue. Uh, yes, we had, and we still had double taxation convention all across Europe, binding state with another state, but the European Commission considered that the double taxation convention are insufficient, are not enough to implement a truly harmonized model. Why? Because they are bilateral. They change according to the specific states that enter into the double taxation convention. That's why in 1990 we, we were in the condition to accept a directive of the taxation on the US. The act, the impact of the directive, the foreign subsidiary, the so-called foreign subsidiary directive on the national legislation. No taxation of source, quite simple. No withholding tax on dividend distributed from a parent company to a subsidiary. No taxation, or exemption, or tax credit, depending on the circumstances of the case of the dividends on the receiving parent company. For instance, in Italy, uh, three years ago, implemented an exemption system. When a company in Italy gets dividend from a subsidiary everywhere in the world, except in tax credit, enjoy an exemption of 95% of the dividends received. Yet, in that circumstances. And we did that, complying with the provision of the directive. Of course, some condition must be met. This is a clear case in which the directive is not applicable because, because we have an holding company, a parent company, established in Australia, and two subsidiaries in the European Union. Yet, we have two subsidiaries which are distributing dividends, the blue, the blue line over there. But the, the directive clearly uh, specifies that all the companies involved must be resident within the European Union to join the low withholding tax mechanism. This is a little more complex. We have still another company outside the European Union, which has a permanent establishment in another European company, a permanent establishment which holds shares in other two companies established in Spain and Portugal. Can the directive be applicable in this case? The answer is clear, straightforward, and this is no. Only company resident in Europe, according to the legislation of specific state, can qualify for the directive. In the case of permanent establishment, in this case of permanent establishment at EE in Ireland, it can qualify for the directive if and only if the company is resident in Europe. So, uh, that would be the case of a company maybe in Italy with a permanent establishment in Ireland holding participation in Spain. This is another case, slightly different from the other. We have the same company, this time in uh, New Zealand for part of the The former two examples were with Australia and one with New Zealand. What happens in this case? Uh, well, distribution of dividend from France and Germany to the holding company in the Netherlands clearly falls within the direct, if, of course, other conditions are met. And the dividend paid by the Netherlands holding company to the parent in New Zealand falls into the national provision, the national tax law of the Netherlands, which in this case probably provides a zero withholding rate or something, or something like that. But the European law allows the member states to implement and introduce anti-avoidance provision that frustrate or impede the implementation of the directive if the company, if the parent company in Europe has no other purpose than acting like a pure holding company paying a dividend abroad. So the parent company in Europe, in this case the company in the Netherlands, must carry on a genuine business activity in order to qualify for the interest in royalties. The scheme is quite similar. But the context is different because here there are no problems of double taxation across Europe. Therefore, the aim pursued by the European Union, the law makers, the legislature, are different. In this case, the double taxation convention were considered as not enough for a true harmonizing market because, and I quote the directive from the text of the directive, the consideranda of the directive itself, uh, takes burdensome administrative formalities, and in any case there were cash flow problems in case of tax credit, etc., especially for the case of interest across Europe. 
So that's why in 2003 we had a, a directive for interest and more. But there were not only necessities in this case, but also fears. The fears in Brussels were of the improper tax planning, the fact that with a directive of that kind, which took the withholding tax to zero, uh, the legislature would have opened the door to an improper tax planning by the citizens. <coughs> so on one side, it's clear that interest and royalties have to be taxed only one time, always in the state of residence of the company which gets interest, gets royalties as well. And in, even in the state, no withholding taxes have been applicable, but at the same, in the same case, in the same circumstance, many conditions have to be met among states. And in their right, uh, 49 of 2003, it's possible to read much more anti avoidance provision that were present in Directive 435 in this respect. So to qualify for Directive 49, a company has to, has to pass different tests. The first, direct participation, which is natural in the part subsidiary, but it is not in the interest of the world. And the second test, the beneficial ownership, which is well known, I think, uh, to lawyers coming from, from the common law mechanism, but it was completely new to us. In the Italian law, in the French law, and I'm not sure, but probably even in German law, the notion of beneficial ownership is a little more than that, but was implemented because probably by the, by the pressure of the UK or the Ireland in order to avoid an improper use and misuse of this directive. So this is, this is a direct participation. In this case, we have a company in Italy, a parent, and a subsidiary in another EU country, more direct participation, and role is paid for. In this case, very falls within the directive. This is not covered. We have a company in the UK with a subsidiary in Malta, which controls a company in Italy. Well, the royalties are paid by a company in Italy to the parent or grandfather or grandmother company in the UK. But this case is not covered by the directive. So Italy is allowed under EU law to apply a withholding tax the role of Spain and the interest as well, because, because the direct participation condition is not met in this case. And these circumstances, this specific circumstances, are also a criticism of the academics in my country and I think everywhere, everywhere in Europe. This is quite complex. The last case I presented to you, a company not resident, of course, in, a, in, a, in, a, in Europe, who use a holding in the States, but not in the Netherlands, well, only in the Netherlands, Luxembourg, I don't see if it's blue or zero, but, but the figure is the same. Anyway, in a European country with a particularly uh, low withholding tax on outbound royalties or outbound interest, which controls the parent of, of the company in the continent and uh, which grant uh, an intellectual property or finance them through a loan or something like that. So in this specific case, royalties paid or even interest from UK, Germany, France, and Italy as well to the Netherlands, clearly falls within the scope of the directive. But our uh, revenue service or our taxation office, I would say, issued a couple of rulings some time ago saying, say, deciding that in this specific case, withholding tax would be still applicable if the company in Luxembourg is not the beneficial ownership of the interest state, just like the former case, more or less. So the problem in this case is the question we have to answer is that the intellectual property belongs to the company in New Zealand or belongs to the company in the Netherlands in Luxembourg. Because if the answer is the first one, intellectual property belongs to the company in New Zealand, which is the licensor, and the company in the Netherlands is the licensee to the licensor, then of course the company in the Netherlands is not the beneficial ownership of that interest, according to our uh, revenue service or our taxation office. On the other, in the other case, of course, it is. That's why, oh, maybe it's a little, a little more. That's why uh, uh, European Union focuses its attention on the uh, that specific avoidance provision. And then, the last provision on capital gains, actually, I prepared a, a slide writing 
capital gains, but actually directly 434 is not for capital gains, but for merger acquisition operation. And states and rules decide that uh, mergers across Europe are should be considered as a tax neutral operation. So capital gains eventually arising from that cases are not taxable in one country and of course in the other. In, in Europe nowadays there is no directive or no general provision similar to Article 13 of the OECD model because probably the European countries were not able to reach a unanimous consensus which is necessary to implement the EU directive or probably because the European countries still think that Article 13 of the OEC model is enough today to solve the problem related to taxation of capital gains. Uh, in most of the cases, the answer is correct. In some other cases that we commented in the past, it is not. Particularly, Article 13 of the C model, in my point of view, but not in any other professor, this is the idea of the is not uh, uh, sufficient, is not enough to, 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 to deal with the problem that we have in Europe regarding the exit taxation. That is to say, the taxes that are levied, direct taxes on capital gains, on accrued but not yet realized capital gains, that arise when a company moves from one country in Europe to another one. There are provisions in Italy that say that when this happens, when a company moves from Italy, for instance, to France, all capital gains on the assets, accrued but not yet realized, must be taxed in Italy upon the departure. But the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg, in a couple of cases, well, actually not involving companies, but individuals, says that those exit taxes are incompatible with the free movement of companies, with the freedom of establishment. So we have cases, we have case law that say that the exit taxes and taxation of capital gains is not consistent with the EU law, but we still not have a provision in that respect. And so I think, stick on time, I took you with this uh, Bird's uh, view uh, evaluation of the of the EU provision on on passive income. I think that this is the frontier that we have right now in, in Europe, and uh, hopefully the legislature will implement it uh, directly in this respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is it Article 56 or um, Directive 56? Uh, 
sorry, out of the, of the treaty, of the treaty. Yes. Of the the, the one that you were talking about that extends to regulating relationships between member states and third parties? Exactly. Is that the only example of um, a rule that extends beyond in, regulating member states? In the case of fundamental freedoms, yes it is, because we have other freedom, as I mentioned before, establishment, um, free movements mm -hmm. of assets, etc., especially it's particularly important for exit taxes and so on. But only Article 56 is applicable to third country. More to the point, I, there are a certain number of uh, limitations to that. That is to say, not every uh, capital is entitled to free movement, but some states could limit Article 56 according to specific reason of public order, maybe, or may limit uh, the article according to previous limitation implemented before 1993, before the, the Maastricht Treaty, etc. So it's a very narrow space, but, uh, but there is. There is, that's the point. Just a general question here. This exit taxation, this is really important to Australia. Non residents, we, we impose taxes three days when they go. We think that's really important to the of our tax system. Presumably, you think the same too. Exactly. So generally, what you think about the ECJ basically dismantling all your national tax systems. I mean, my idea is not, well, many, 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 many practitioners, many, many authors already have written papers on the issue of exit taxation in Europe and I think maybe in Australia as well. But to me, I think that the most interesting aspect is not the outbound movement, but the inbound. That is to say, I could agree with you that you want to tax the accrued but not yet realized capital gains when you step out of a, of, a, of a state, you get into an army. But what is the value that you attribute to those who are assets when you get into the others? Because if I have a, maybe this example of a, a trademark or a patent worth 100, I get out of Italy and the Italian revenue service say, okay, that's not 100, that now uh, as available, it would be evaluated as 200. But the capital gains is 100. But I step into Germany. What about the German revenue service? You could say, well, the fair value of that asset is 200 because the Italians say so, unlike because we are Italian and because of many reasons. <laughs> they could say it's still 100 or 300. So there could be some gaps. Double taxation, probably, but even double non taxation. The European Court of Justice, using of your patient, the European Court of Justice is carrying on in a uh, an activity uh, that, uh, philosophically speaking, we could say the past best towards the demolishing part of the European law. But we still are missing the past constituents, that is to say, the provision aimed at building up the mechanism. They say exit tax are not consistent with EU law. That's good. But if we say that exit taxes are not consistent, then we open the door to tax avoidance, double non taxation, etc., etc., etc. We need some body. Finish the phrases. Try to close the gate before all the ships. 